This meeting is now being recorded. All right, uh, good morning or uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, this is Brian Arbogast. I'm the director of the uh, WASH team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks very much for joining us today uh, for our Gender and the Sanitation Value Chain webinar. Um, Aaron, I saw you sign in. If you could just text us that you can hear me, that would let us know that we're all good to go. Um, fantastic. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm excited about... Um, uh, today's uh, webinar because it's been an interesting journey that we've been on uh, at the WASH team as we've gotten uh, become kind of more and more um, aware of our opportunities uh, with regards to focus on gender. Uh, as some of you may know, I joined the team in, uh, in May of 2013. And when I joined, uh, there was already a, a very interesting collection of, of investments that had been made uh, that related to gender and sanitation. Now, for example, there was uh, some interesting research being done on the relationship between women in decision-making positions and sanitation outcomes. Uh, there were uh, a, a number of investments that looked at um, women's preferences around menstrual hygiene management products. Uh, and even though the reinvented toilet, reinvent the toilet challenge was still pretty early on, uh, there were already a lot of considerations um, being made by the by the technology partners to looking at the preferences and different design considerations um, based on gender, and so uh, this was certainly something that that many people on the team were thinking about. But it was uh, it was I guess 2014 when Melinda uh, in effect challenged the foundation and and challenged us <laughs> in a public way um, with uh, with a very prominent article that she uh, uh, put out challenged us to really be more thoughtful about how do we think about gender in all the work that we do and how can we be more thoughtful about um, the impact of our work and our work through partners on, on women and girls um, uh, in particular. And so um, and that's when uh, we at the WASH team started to think uh, more broadly about um, what would a more thoughtful journey look like for us. Uh, the next year, in late 2015, Sarah Hendricks joined the foundation uh, as the director in charge of gender equality, and we actually uh, paused some of our efforts to align with hers, uh, and then became, in effect, the, the first uh, uh, program strategy team here to go through uh, some internal um, work that you'll hear more about today uh, that, that um, is helping to really get more systematic and broader in terms of how we think about uh, being gender intentional in the work that we do. So without any further ado, um, I would like to hand it off uh, uh, to, uh, to Jen McCleary-Sills, who works on the gender equality team, uh, to give you a little bit of sense of, uh, uh, of that effort. And, uh, and she and other members of, uh, of, of my WASH team will give you a sense of the journey to date and, of course, uh, the role that we um, that we hope to play uh, with all of you in our broad partner ecosystem. So with that, uh, Jen, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, as Brian just mentioned, the, the gender journey at the foundation began even before there was a gender team. And so some of you may have been following this progress, but what's very exciting for us, particularly those of us on the gender team, is that we now have a, an approved strategy. It was just approved in November of last year and will be launched next week, but you all are going to get a bit of a sneak peek today just to get a sense of what it is that the gender equality team is now committing to doing. And so if you look at this slide, you'll see the purpose of our team, again, the newly formed team over the last couple of years, is essentially to help accelerate progress toward the foundation's other goals. So the work, for example, that the WASH team is doing with, um, with sanitation, the work that our financial services for the poor colleagues are doing with financial systems and digital financial inclusion around the globe, and the work of all of our other sectoral focused teams. So we're looking at this through three main areas of, um, of engagement, and you can see these delineated here, amplifying the impact of the work that the foundation is doing, building the gender equality field, which we recognize is a very rich field that already has more than 30 years of experience and evidence and energy behind it, and also driving innovation and learning. And the way that we're dividing that up then 
into these three areas will help you understand where the Washington fits in. And so in the first big bucket of amplifying the impact, and what you'll see launched next week is women's economic empowerment strategy. And it has a focus on a few key areas. So that's digital financial inclusion work that is already being led by our colleagues in financial services for the poor. It will also have a focus on women's market inclusion, which is um, led ably by our colleagues in the agricultural development team. And they are also going to be working hand-in-hand -hand with us on a program looking at women's land tenure security. And then as a cross-cutting issue, we're looking at self-help groups as a way of delivering women's economic empowerment interventions and programming. So that's one set of ways that we're really digging into amplifying the impact of what the foundation is already doing. Within that as well, we have a very strong commitment to mainstreaming a gender lens across our investments and across our portfolios. And you can see that then um, in the next bucket below where the WASH team, as Brian said, was the, the first pioneering team to begin this journey with us. Um, and you'll hear more about that journey shortly. Also, the FSP team and the Ag Dev team is coming on very soon as our next what we call deep dive team. And then we hope to bring on the family planning team later this year. So those are the, some of the ways that we're really committing to bringing about this change and amplifying the, the impact of the foundation's work. In the next two buckets, you can also see the emphasis on building the gender equality field. Um, through data and evidence, we have one large initiative called the Initiative for What Works. You may have seen an announcement that Melinda made in September um, at the UN General Assembly during our Goalkeepers event, and that was an announcement of some large investments we're making in women's movements around the globe. And then we have ongoing work um, with champions and communications efforts to really spread the word about why gender equality matters as a development imperative. And again, some investments on SDG accountability, including some of our commitments around gender data work, which again, you may have seen an announcement through Women Deliver um, two years ago that really highlighted the investment we're making there with partners like Data2x. And then finally, um, in driving innovation and learning, there's a the Women and Girls at the Center of Development Grand Challenge that was launched in 2014, and we funded 22 investments around the globe. Um, looking at different ways to really bring a gender focus into some of the investments that, that the foundation is making and bringing some new partners into the fold, and that's been a great success. We're still doing some learning um, and bringing those partners together to really understand what are the key bits of innovation that are coming from it, what are we actually learning about what works now um, to drive gender equality through our investments. And something that you may see happening a bit more in the future is a, an increased focus on youth healthy transitions and a, a learning agenda there in partnership with our health PSTs. But at the core of our strategy is really this understanding of um, what women's economic empowerment is and the different elements of it. So on the next slide you'll see just a few of the pieces that we highlighted, and this comes from a, a large amount of data and analysis and the time that our team spent over the last more than a year to understand if we really want to lean into women's economic empowerment and we want to amplify the impact of what um, our foundation is already doing in this space, where should we be looking? What are the ways that we should be leaning into that and which levers should we pull? And so we're really focusing on access to income and assets, improving control and benefit from economic gains. So again, the distinction here between not just having access to these assets, but actually having some control or agency over them, which we think is a critical distinction between just being in, involved as a development um, participant in development programs and actually benefiting from and being empowered by them. Along those same lines, focusing on the power to make decisions and foundational health, which I mentioned just now, is some, it's a focus that you'll see coming out later but will probably not be highlighted in the launch that you'll see next week. And the idea of all of this then is if we can focus on these important elements of empowerment, that we should actually be able to see women as healthy, empowered economic actors. And the ultimate impact of that then would be increased equality, reduced poverty, and intergenerational effects, as many of you may know. And there's a great deal of evidence that shows where women actually have the power to make decisions and how resources are invested, it actually has positive knock-on effects um, in the next generation. So children are healthier, more likely to stay in school, and so forth. So that's just a, the, the framing of what it is that our um, new strategy will focus on. And again, we'll, you'll be hearing more about that next week when it's publicly launched. So now I'll pass it over to Jess Pinton from the 
Thanks, team. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, so, so next, I'm going to take you through a, a little bit of the backstory behind the foundation's uh, deep dive gender journey uh, and the work that we've done with the gender equality team here uh, here at the foundation. So, as Brian mentioned in his introduction this morning, we we at the we in the Wash team uh, had been thinking about gender and sanitation uh, for for a long time uh, before the gender equality team came into existence. But we've really been thinking about it in two dimensions. One is around our work on menstrual hygiene management, which many of you are familiar with over the last couple of years. And the other way is around kind of our facilities and use work, which is really through our reinvented toilet technologies. And we were thinking about it really about how to make sure that those facilities were, were really set up in a way to adapt to the needs of women, particularly around disposal of menstrual hygiene products. Our goal is that after taking on this additional deep dive learning, action learning agenda with the gender equality team, was that we would start to think about gender and sanitation across the entire sanitation value chain, from decision and influence through the, the reinvented technologies portfolio to construction, maintenance, and of course, containment, emptying, transport, treatment, and reuse. And the idea is that we would think about gender and how it could impact every single piece of that sanitation value chain. We're still on that journey, but I think we've made a huge shift to start to think about that work in a really integrated way and look at a gender lens across that full value chain. So what do we mean when we say an action learning approach? And what has the WASH team at the Gates Foundation been doing to really integrate this approach and this lens to our work? Well, there were several steps that we took on with the gender equality team. They asked for some volunteers from across the foundation, and because we were already thinking so much about gender, and, and wash already, we said yes, we would volunteer to be one of the first guinea pigs, if you will, uh, for, the, for the gender deep dive work. So what that consisted of to start was a series of three day long trainings from basic gender terminology and understanding of the differences all the way through to how to help the program officers on our team truly integrate the work on gender into the way we're thinking about our, making our investments and even improving the current investments that we have across the WASH portfolio. This is a really exciting experience for us and the team learned a lot. I think even those of us who've been working on gender prior to the gender equality team learned so much more, not only about how to apply the work to our specific investments, but also how to be a better resource to many of our grantees and partners as, as our partners start to take on this work. Of course, many of our partners have been doing this much longer than we have, and so we're also learning from the field as we go and making sure that we integrate and adapt those lessons as we, as we continue on this, on this journey. In addition to three intense trainings that we, we did with the entire team and the gender equality team, we also started to understand a little bit more how our strategy itself could be more intentional. We realized that to, to start off that work, we really needed to do a deep evidence review of the current links between WASH and gender across that full value chain. We intentionally did the gender review, the evidence review, which you'll hear a little bit more in depth about throughout today's webinar, uh, as an independent study. We had FSG, a consultancy firm, really take a look at that and not match it to our strategy, but look at it in an independent lens just to make sure that we were, weren't missing any gaps and that it could be something useful as a public good for the field and not only for the foundation's own internal work. In addition to the evidence review, which you will hear more about today, we also produced a set of three gender case studies. Those case studies looked at three of our partners that were really doing gender intentional work already. And it took, took an, a, a lens of looking at what were some of the challenges that they faced what were some of the opportunities they still had, and where, were there, where was there room for improvement? So we really see those as learning opportunities about what's happened and how we can improve in the future. Those will also be made available today after the webinar. We have a series of other activities, which you'll see on the bottom part of the slide, if you're looking at the slides today, uh, where we're still in progress. And I would say that we will continue to be on a learning gen uh, agenda and a learning journey as we continue on throughout our time here at the, at the WASH Strategy at the Gates Foundation. On our learning agenda, we're really trying to think about looking forward, what are some of the big gaps that were identified in the evidence review, and how can we as the foundation aligned with our strategy really start to explore what some of those questions could be? How can we help and lend better evidence to the field around the intersection of gender and sanitation? We also have started to look at really deeply in our strategy, how are there ways to accelerate uh, how we're looking at gender to make sure that we're not missing any key strategic opportunities 
or uh, because we haven't looked at gender in the past. And then finally, we're starting to think about how we track and measure the impact of our work on gender and how we really start to see whether or not we're making those strategic choices in a way that moves the needle on gender integration. So I've mentioned a couple of terms today uh, that we are starting to use here at the foundation, and we wanted to introduce them to the broader community because we think they help to describe kind of the continuum of work, ranging from what we call gender unintentional to gender transformative. Uh, and this, this kind of framing helps us to think about where we are today and perhaps where, as a community, we want to be in the future. The term gender unintentional for us uh, is, is an investment, a program, a policy, a platform that does not recognize the impact of gender at all. Perhaps it wasn't actually considered in part of the design of the program. Perhaps data just isn't available to look at whether or not it's gender disaggregated and what the impact is on different, different genders. Often these sorts of programs can result in the unintended, unintended consequences to gender relations and to women and girls. Uh, of course, we don't want this to happen, and so it's really important to always look at a gender lens when you're programming. Well, one of the lessons that we found on the WASH team is that sometimes it's surprising that you might think a technology is neutral or that it doesn't necessarily need to take gender into account. And what we've learned as a team together is that is a very, very rare situation where gender does not actually potentially have an impact at some point along that value chain or at some part of use in that, in that technology even by itself. The next term in, is right there in the middle, gender intentional. And this is where not only are we recognizing that gender could have an impact in the work we're doing, but also that an investment policy program or platform is actually working to reduce gender gaps in access to resources. For example, by improving the condition of women and girls. This, this kind of middle, middle of, of our three steps here, and it's really a continuum more than steps, um, is really looking intentionally at whether or not gender is impacting the work and how and we can understand better how gender could influence that outcome. Finally, on gender transformative, this is where gender is transforming gender power relations and norms, really changing the system and the way that, that we influence and, and talk about gender. An investment policy program or platform in this, in this category really seeks to transform gender power relations and norms and also looks to increase women's and girls' economic or other types of empowerment. An example in this section is really around access and control and agency of women's use of decision-making power, for example. And we can go through in some of the question and answer some of the examples that really, really talk more about this kind of gender transformative lens. We're still really learning in the WASH sector, and so we don't have tons of examples right now that really are what we would call gender transformative, but we're looking for more examples. So we would be happy to, for those of you who feel like you have a program that is really taking on this agenda, we would love to hear from you and learn more about the work that you're doing. Uh, now I'm going to uh, pass the mic back over to two of my colleagues, um, Lucero Quiroga and Radu Ban from the WASH team, who are really going to help us learn a bit more about the review of evidence that we just completed as part of our WASH gender learning journey. Um, so as I said before, the evidence review is really a neutral uh, look into what's already been out there and the intersection of WASH and gender. Uh, so over to you guys to tell us a little bit more about what we've learned. Thank you, uh, Jess. Uh, Jess, our so I'm, I'm Radu, Radu Ban on the, on the WASH team. I'm on the, on the microphone now. Um, as my colleague Jess mentioned, uh, one of the uh, initial outputs of, of our um, main, gender mainstreaming journey was this uh, um, review of evidence around uh, the importance of gender in sanitation and sanitation in gender. Uh, it's important to highlight before we dive into some of the findings that this was really taken from a neutral perspective. So we actually had a third party to, to conduct this review um, separate from, from our own investment in, 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 in WASH and, and in gender. So it tries to really reflect the, uh, the strength of the evidence in, in the field rather than any particular uh, point of view. Uh, and, you know, the, the slide itself is fairly self-explanatory. We wanted to understand how gender influenced sanitation and, uh, and, to, and the extent to which sanitation is important for, for gender equality. Um, 
let's have this looked at at the, at the strength of evidence from a neutral perspective to understand what we know, but also what where the, the knowledge gaps are, and also uh, to, to highlight what obviously we're interested in in, in doing things uh, that are informed by this evidence review. So there were the goals around uh, highlighting what are potentially intervention areas in the sanitation value chain. So, Lucero, I'll, I'll let you take the, the first cut at the, at the evidence review, and then I'll come back and uh, where we agreed on. Thank you, Radu, and um, good morning and good evening to all of you that have joined us today. Um, it's really an exciting time for us at the Gender Equality Team to, to have this opportunity to share some of the findings. Um, of the evidence review with, with all of you and, of course, hoping to um, get your interest in, in, in actually reading through the summary version of the evidence review, which we will be sharing after this, this webinar. Uh, and just a couple of more thoughts on, on, on our vision, on the gender equality team's vision, both for working with the WASH team, and, and thank you, Jeff, so much for for that really good review of, of the journey that we've been sharing over the last year or so, um, was that we really believe this evidence review to be a central piece of um, setting the stage for our work together. In other words, really taking a look at um, not only does gender matter across the sanitation value chain, but also what do we already know about that? And, and certainly the foundation is no stranger to conducting evidence reviews, um, but we really wanted to make sure that this time it was truly fit for purpose. And, and so the, both teams work really closely um, with our external partner in, in shaping how to conduct this inquiry and, and where to look. And ultimately, this process looked at over 100 uh, peer review academic papers and program reports evaluations, case studies, all sorts of documentation, really, um, scouring the field for, for those uh, gems, for those really clear pieces of uh, evidence that links our two fields together. Um, and also looked a little beyond uh, the, the, the directly related disciplines into other complementary disciplines. I, I remember often hearing how they had even gone into the veterinary sciences for some uh, learning on the link between gender and sanitation. Um, but really what we were trying to do was find out what was already out there that could build a case for, for our work together, um, but also to learn about what would we what we would need to do um, to be better about collecting information. So very early on, the very large evidence gaps became evident. And so we started also to, to ask questions about how we could be better about collecting information um, and data. And, and also to, to, to start building our, our shared appetite for more context-specific information, always knowing that at the heart of conducting this review, would be the opportunity to, to have better design and implementation of this investment and, and platform. So um, if we could go to the next slide, um, we'll start sharing some of the, some of the things that we, that we found. For instance, we, we first wanted to look at the larger picture. So um, What's some of the evidence on the relationship between sanitation outcomes and outcomes for, for other sectors? And we wanted to do this because um, in our intention to work together, we, we truly believe that sanitation programs can be leveraged to improve gender equality, um, but also that gender equality can be addressed as a way of improving sanitation outcomes. So we, we think that finding some of the opportunities to leverage both sectors is really what, what sets the stage for our work together. Um, and some of the first findings from this review were that there was certainly sufficient evidence to suggest that when women and girls have poor access to sanitation, they do bear a greater burden and suffer worse outcomes than men. Um, I would say worse, but also different. And we'll spend a lot of time in these slides um, in today's conversation looking at how some of those differences come in. Um, and so here, is, there's a, a quick summary of three of the sectors that we looked at. We looked at health outcomes, 
and discovered some important information on how women and girls experience higher rates of infection from poor sanitation conditions and access, and also that there are causal links between mother's exposure to poor sanitation and infant mortality. Um, there was a lot of writing and, and, and research on the connection between fear of violence outside the home um, and in accessing sanitation, and I'll share some information on that as well. On the side of education outcomes, and I think this will, will not be new to most of you, there was, there's certainly enough information on how poor sanitation impacts both boys and girls in terms of um, absenteeism and attendance particularly girls around managing menstruation. So here we have a, a very striking figure of how only 6.9 girls in Sierra Leone said that their schools had water available in private areas to wash during menstruation. So already we started seeing what some of the big issues are that are um, really top of mind for, for the field. Um, but also a note here that although there is plenty of evidence linking sanitation to absence, there was really a lot less in terms of school performance. And we started thinking that that would definitely be one of the areas to look more, more deeply into. In terms of economic outcomes, we discovered that um, although both men and women seem to experience a substantial loss of productive time related to poor sanitation, Program-related data really started suggesting that women experience more sanitation-related time poverty than men. And, of course, that has a lot to do with what women's roles are in sanitation um, and who gets to, to make decisions about those roles. So from, from this information, um, we started to see that the interplay between gender and sanitation really, really merited a, a careful exploration of what was happening in different areas. So we structured the evidence review, and you'll see this when you read it, in terms of dynamics within the household, um, within community and public areas, and then within public and private enterprise. So if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll start our exploration of what's happening at the household. Um, first of all, just acknowledging that there, there are the field commonly collects data at the household level, and this certainly pro, uh, presents a, a methodological challenge in doing a gender analysis or in identifying gender differences in preferences within the household and in inter-household dynamics um, in terms of who is deciding over what. Uh, but even within this limitation, there was enough information to, to sort of analyze and collect to start um, identifying at least these three areas where gender relations within the household truly influence sanitation-related decisions. So, first of all, um, the question of how will household a household ha um, access sanitation, and specifically, will a household have a latrine or an in-household um, sanitation product or solution? Um, and a lot of the data started coming in in terms of the differences and what drives these preferences. So differences in terms of um, – sorry, I got distracted by the question. Um, differences in terms of uh, what drives men to want to have an in-home latrine versus what might be driving women's um, interest in, in having that household latrine. Um, and just understanding that there's a difference in those drivers, we found to be really powerful in, in how interventions are designed. Um, but we also found that when there is too much emphasis placed in one side of the equation, so for example, what is driving men to build that in-house latrine, um, that some of the patriarchal norms that are behind who makes decisions um, could actually be reinforced. And we saw some good studies of how some of these programs might have been reinforcing um, women's isolation or lack of mobility um, by, by really 
creating a solution, but at the same time not anticipating some of the um, other consequences that, that that could have. Another important area of decision making that is clearly affected by, by gender relations is who in the household can access or use the facility, and does this change um, depending on, on timing? So here, first and foremost, was the issue of, of menstrual hygiene management and how norms around menstruation um, could really be establishing different rules about when women and girls can access, whether they are in household um, or other ways of, of accessing sanitation. So this continues to be a very important area of, of inquiry to, to look into and also to think about how the um, sanitation intervention can address some of these norms so that um, access can be expanded. Um, we also found, however, that in the, in the area of who can access and when, men had some issues uh, as well to, to be thought about. So that there were also certainly taboos around how men access sanitation and that that could be affecting their um, practices and their choices. Um, finally, in the area of in-household decision-making, the question of who does what, uh, both in relation to construction and maintenance, is very important and that a gender lens um, is necessary to truly understand how those roles are, are interplaying and, and who gets to decide. So in the area of um, the day-to-day -day sanitation burden, so basically who does the cleaning, who educates children around hygiene, and who does the day-to-day -day maintenance of latrines, women still seem to be playing a predominant role and that this can definitely contribute to, to time poverty, something we had mentioned before. Um, whereas with men, where they're, they continue to have a leading role in construction and financing, um, there's very little known in terms of the implications of this on other sanitation decisions. Um, another area that we looked at in how household dynamics, but also just ge uh, general societal gender dynamics might be playing is um, in the community and public space area. So in the next slide, we'll see how these are two issues that the two issues that we looked at in this arena where, for example, the use of paper-use public toilets and the idea of privacy, so the need for privacy in establishing public um, public toilets. So in the area of paper-use, um, and, and I think it's, well, it's well recognized that user fees can lead to, to underutilization of, of public toilets. Um, but the question here was, is that reality different for, for women and men? So are gender dynamic, dynamics interplaying with the, use, uh, with the paper use issue in creating different barriers to usage? And here a lot of the evidence uh, revolved around women, women needing more frequent access um, and, and frankly also women um, so needing more frequent access, not that men didn't need as much access, but that they would also be uh, driven to, to make other choices um, about when to use a paper-use toilet. So the, the issue that women need more access both for their own needs but also for the needs of their children often led to, to, to barriers to access, especially in areas where women may have less access to income or less control over the money needed to to use. Um, on the area of need for privacy, I think also um, a lot of the evidence was pointing at was the sign of public uh, toilets actually considering the need to protect privacy um, or was this becoming a barrier when it was not taken into consideration for, the, for their use. And here, again, um, not to assume that the need for privacy is only an issue that affects women. There was also studies, for example, the study um, in Zambia that found that men were also concerned about being seen accessing a public toilet, um, especially since they could use, they, they could just 
use open urination uh, much easier than a woman would. And so they would only need to use private toilets um, for some, some of the time. And I think around both of these issues, so uh, when and how and, and, and does the woman have the resources to use the pay-per-use toilet or um, publicly available toilets that don't um, sufficiently take care of the privacy issue, um, a lot of the evidence started surfacing the issue of fear of violence, um, specifically gender-based violence around public toilets. So we just crafted one example that um, tracks a lot of the studies or the information present in the different papers that were reviewed. And so in the next slide, we can see how um, a relationship that, that was analyzed was how taboos and norms related to privacy require women in particular, um, but as we saw, not only, not to be seen in public accessing sanitation, and how this often led to women um, waiting until very late um, to use public toilets or continuing to, to practice open defecation. Or there's also studies linking uh, women um, abstaining from eating or drinking water during the day so that they could delay going to the public toilet. Um, uh, but, however, the fact that they were going uh, late at night and, and sometimes these public toilets were not well lit, um, combined with this practice of fear and increased vulnerability to, to gender violence, but also an increased fear of violence, um, and how all of these issues really combine to create a lot of stress and, and um, just, just mental health issues, frankly, around the the use of public sanitation. Um, it's important to note that, that in the studies that were analyzed, children were also seen to be suffering um, from this chain of events, and, and specifically boys and girls in Afghanistan. And this middle example um, reported fear and anxiety around having to use public toilets. Um, so the, these are some of the findings of the, of the interview that you'll be able to read more about in the paper um, for these two spaces, so for the household and the community and public spaces. But I'd now like to pass it on to Radu, who's going to tell you a little bit more about um, how enterprises are taking a look at, at some of these issues or sometimes not so much. So, Radu, over to you. Thank you, Lucero. Um, just before jumping into the um, uh, enterprise and, and policy space, on your, your last point about uh, the gender violence is, is an important one, and obviously it, it elicits very uh, visceral reactions, but there's, there's two ways in which we sometimes see the, the, this issue of sanitation and gender violence being kind of uh, the, the policy implications not really reflect the uh, the, the, the data out there. The, the first is, you know, we often see messages around, you know, building toilets in order to reduce uh, gender gender-based violence, um, which is probably not not very well evidence-based because, as you know, we see the summary statistics, most of the gender-based violence doesn't happen outside the home. It doesn't happen with with strangers, right? Most, you know, if you look at uh, you know at, at India's latest National Family Health Survey. Um, you know, about one percent of the of the sexual based violence is uh, perpetrated by by non intimate partners. Right. So if if someone wants to reduce gender based violence, probably um, investing in sanitation is not the, the the first lever that that needs to be used. And the second way in which the the the, the link between sanitation and gender based violence is sometimes um, uh, you know not acted on properly is. Through methods that kind of reinforce the the, the, the the patriarchal system, so often we see messages around you know build latrines so that women don't have to go out of the house, right? And obviously we think in a in a, in a properly uh, functioning society, women should be able to go out of the house for many reasons, um, you know. So it's not you know you don't want to have unintended consequence of limiting women's mobility 
uh, through through these messages. So, and, and now we can we can move on to the um, public and, and, and private enterprise. The evidence review, uh, you know, really reflects that that um, two, two, two main things that. Um, there's a lot of gendered roles in in in, in, in the sanitation um, enterprise that 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 you know affect both men and women uh, by by limiting their their both their employment and and and, and social opportunities. So the, the the example from from Ghana where uh, pit emptying is is considered to be a, a um, an occupation reserved for men, but then those men end up you know having limited uh, you know social opportunities. And then in, in India, where uh, particularly the, the, the manual scavengers that, that uh, clean the, the dry latrines tend to be almost exclusively women, and uh, really they, they are marginalized and, 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 and their, their opportunities be, become very limited. The other part of the, of the review really reflected that once you move above these informal occupations, uh, women really tend to be uh, just underrepresented. Um, there, there is a formal uh, survey that, that shows how underrepresented they are, and even in in, in, in our own work, we um, we have examples of, of, of women entrepreneurs, but it tends to be the one example that we always say. And, and people that have been in these webinars, they all know the great example of Madame Fa in Senegal, who's such a great entrepreneur. But yet, it is one example that we can give, right? So I don't want to kind of say that's not good, but, you know, in a, in a, in a, as we move towards better integrating gender and sanitation, you want to have more than this one uh, exceptional example. Can we go to the next slide? In the, the review also looked at how uh, gender differences are or are not considered in, in the design process of, of, of sanitation um, uh, facilities. And, you know, as, as, the, as, as the title suggests, you know, in most cases the design doesn't often take into account uh, gender preference. There's this interesting example of the Aqua Privy uh, in South Africa. You know, the, 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 the technical idea was to reduce the, the, the need for, uh, for, for water supply and also to reduce odor, but because there was no consideration of the, of the gender differences, uh, this type of facility ended up uh, imposing, you know, some constraints on, on, uh, uh, on women in the sense that they, um, they don't necessarily want to be seen performing these, these maintenance uh, or, or, the, or the, the regular operation of, of, of these facilities. The, the second example um, is, you know, I think we, we, we may have not worded properly, but it, it meant to, to reflect a, a more positive uh, example of, of a situation that started with, with a, you know, with a conventional system that did not include, um, did not integrate women's preferences, but. Um, you know, through a, a uh, during a, a redesign process where, where the engineers kind of went back to the users, uh, to, a, to a balanced panel of, of both men and women users, they, they went back and said, well, what are ways in which this, this, the design of this uh, clean toilet uh, can be made to, can be redesigned to better represent women's preferences? Um, one of the, the things that, you know, maybe in hindsight it was obvious, but women really had a, a preference for uh, safety and privacy, so making sure that the locks function, um, you know, so, so now th this facility has that. So even small things that everybody thinks it's obvious, um, it, it's sort of surprising to see they are not consistently including, included in the design of, of facility. Now if we move on to the uh, next slide around um, the, the role that, that gender plays play or does not play in, in sanitation policy. The the review overall um, you know brings forth the message that there's a there's a there's a lack of just consideration of gender in, in policies, a lack of, of budget allocated to, to, to gender policies, and also uh, very importantly a lack of, of data, uh, a gender disaggregated data that informs policy. And on the 
on the last bullet, it, it, it is very interesting to, to note that, um, you know, the, the, the new sustainable development goals have language that, that indicate, um, uh, you know, that, that the sector is driving towards safely managed sanitation with a, with a focus on, on a number of disadvantaged categories, including, uh, um, including women. But there, there is very little data that is in, in, indeed gender disaggregated. Most of the data is collected household level. And, and really, if the data is collected at household level, there's very little that one could say about, about the, the, the gender differences if there's one uh, observation per, per, per household. I think this is where the evidence review ends, and then we'll, we'll just loop back to, to Lucero to, to talk a little bit about the uh, approaches to, to gender integration. But we'll, we'll, there's, there's time for, for question and answer, so don't feel like we've exhausted the, the evidence review topic. Thank you, Radu. And, and in fact, um, we did ask the team to also look at what were some of the emerging approaches to gender integration. Um, and I think they actually found that donors, policymakers, and, and practitioners were taking important steps, uh, both towards understanding the connection and the link between gender and sanitation, but also towards um, having that new understanding reflected in how they were thinking about their uh, work and, and how they were actively uh, integrating some of the results of their gender analysis into their work. So here we just wanted to highlight some of the very top level emerging uh, approaches that they identified. Starting with something that um, actually Jeff, Jeff uh, told us a little about earlier in the webinar when she was talking about the categories for levels of integration. And we did find that many of, of um, peer, peer organizations were starting to, to do this thorough review of their work um, to, to put it, to, to basically chart it along that continuum that just described. And obviously the categories change, the language is different across different organizations, um, but the general idea of the continuum between um, very little or no consideration or even understanding of gender to uh, increasing um, investment in trying to address some of the connections between gender inequalities, specifically, and, and sanitation outcomes. Um, and a lot of this is based, needs to be based, on context-specific gender analysis. So you'll see throughout the evidence review um, very geography-specific examples. And this is um, a good reflection that you can't really come up with a uh, one-size-fits-all solution in the area of, of gender and sanitation. That anything that we come up with needs to be founded on a, a very systematic, context-specific analysis of gender, how gender dynamics affect um, sanitation outcomes. And, and this is so that in program design and, and implementation and measurement, the barriers that come up from the gender analysis can be appropriately um, addressed um, and addressed it at whichever level of integration an organization finds itself or finds that it can really um, go at a problem, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, something else that's really emerging, and we were very happy to see it reflected in our own pathway with the WASH team, um, was the importance of capacity building um, across teams. So an understanding that staff at all levels can benefit from gender training, um, but also as important, as important that diverse actors can learn from each other's work. And so uh, a very clear commitment to knowledge sharing, which we're very happy to see our, our teams taking on. And, and I think this webinar is a, is a reflection of that. And, and like was mentioned before, the fact that the evidence review was also seen as something that be con contributed to the to the field along with the case study, um, and then ultimately the understanding that there's still a lot that we don't know about, and and that the more that we dig into it, um, more questions come up. So a growing commitment in to research in order to fill 
specific evidence gaps uh, was also something that our reviewers identified and, and that we're happy to be a part of. Um, so that with this, um, we really hope that, that you're interested in, in, in reading more in, in the evidence review and, and other tools that we'll be sharing. Um, but I think it's time now to, to open up for some questions. So, uh, Graham, I will pass it on to you. Yes, thank you, Lucero. Hi, everyone. Uh, Graham Sneed from the WASH team here. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to cover quickly um, some, uh, some things that will be uh, shared after the webinar today, and we've talked about them a bit, but uh, the presentation deck, a recording of the webinar, and the evidence review will all, will all be shared, and, uh, and we'll also share some, some case studies and a simple gender integration guide uh, to, to, as, a, as a part of the um, uh, kind of the suite of tools that we have so far. And, and obviously, as we continue to develop uh, sort of global public goods as it relates to gender and sanitation, uh, we'll make sure to send them your way. And so, um, um, so with that, we'll uh, we'll go to questions. And we got one um, earlier during during uh, Jen's presentation that I want to go back to, and it was from Sonali. And the question was, does access and control also mean ownership? This has significantly impacted empowerment and reduction of violence. And so, so I'll toss it to Jen uh, to address that one. Great. Thanks for the question, Sonali. So I think to start with the first part of it, of whether access and control also mean ownership, I, for me, ownership is part of, but um, it doesn't necessarily stretch to include access or rather control. So ownership could be just a legal term. It could mean that technically, you know, your name is on the document for whatever whatever it is that you're owning, whether it be a cell phone or um, any other resource. And so the distinction that I find really important here is not just who owns it, um, who has access to it, but truly who gets to make decisions about how that resource is used. And that's where we would make the distinction between um, simple access and even ownership with control, or my preferred term for it is agency, which means that truly you can make decisions about how something is used without any fear of repercussions. So if you have to use a resource um, quietly or um, you know, behind closed doors so that nobody else can see it, then I would say you may have ownership but do not have full agency over that, and it's an important distinction. And it's a distinction that gets to your second point, which is about this question of um, reduction of violence. And I, I don't know which resources you were thinking of, but perhaps you were responding to our emphasis on the strategy on um, economic empowerment. And I would agree with you that there is some evidence that having women become economically empowered, meaning having true agency over economic resources, does reduce violence. But there are a number of programs out there that aim to give women more access to economic resources and have actually found that there might be a spike in intimate partner violence in particular. Um, or programs that aim to bring women into the, the workforce outside of the home, and they may also experience increases in violence. And so, again, it's this distinction between giving them access and actually focusing then on empowerment. It's, it's partly the distinction that Jess made earlier between um, a gender intentional and a gender transformative investment, and one that would focus, if it were transformative, on some of the other um, power dynamics that are involved with, um, with ownership and access and agency over a resource. Great, thank you, Jen. Okay, so we got we got another question earlier from Pippa that was um, was the gender and sanitation uh, review of both urban and rural contexts, and I just want to make sure uh, that everyone saw Radu's response. But uh, but yes, it did include both both. And uh, um, uh, Beatrice, you also asked, could you please share the study approach uh, that will be included when we share um, uh, the evidence review? The, the methodology is in there, um, and so. Uh, uh, just to, to address those two somewhat related questions. And then Rupa, you asked, are there gender analyses indicators for aspects like conveyance, treatment, reuse, and disposal uh, across the sanitation value chain? And so for that, we'll go over to Radu um, to answer. Thanks, Graham. And, uh, thank you. I think it goes together with a, a follow-up question from, from Lucy Stephen, which asked, are there parts of sanitation value chain where gender issues are particularly neglected or is it a fairly even picture across the chain? I think they are related because we do see a, a dearth of data and, and indicators, particularly once you leave the kind of the household context. So we know more about the uh, role that sanitation 
plays in gender and gender plays in sanitation at household level, but there's very little in terms of data indicators beyond that. So I guess the short answer Short answer is no. We don't have good indicator, but it's, it's something that we are trying to uh, to improve on, and we have um, you know we, we work with our partners to, to add to that to that data gap. Okay. Thank you, Radu. Um, so we have, we have another question from Lucy. Said, did you find any agencies actors who are really championing gender issues in sanitation? And so. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll go to Jess first, but also ask Lucero to chime in if, uh, if she has any comments. Thanks. Hi. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great work uh, happening happening in India, and particularly the Fecal Sludge and Septic Management uh, Alliance there is actually really thinking about how to better integrate gender into, into policy within India and how to think about uh, the opportunities there across many of their organizations. So I think there's a lot of really good work happening, happening in India at the moment, um, although, of course, there's, there's always a lot more that we can do, and, and we're excited and hopeful that some of the, the recommendations from the Alliance will, will make it into more of a substantial policy conversation uh, very soon. Uh, I think that the, in terms of agencies or actors more generally across the sanitation space, I think it's really a mix of different types of actors who've been engaged. Uh, I think it's a lot of... Uh, the, the, the folks you would think, um, organizations and INGOs like WaterAid have done a tremendous amount of, of work uh, thinking about menstrual hygiene management and applying that to different country settings. Um, but really it's been a mix of, of, of nonprofit uh, actors that have really stepped forward. Um, but this study, this evidence review, didn't do an intensive look at a series of, of actors and agencies and what their roles in, 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 have been across the sanitation value chain. It really looked at the evidence and literature review. Uh, and so I think there's a lot more work that could be done to do a good assessment of what's really been done out there in terms of um, an inventory of good programs or, or policies. Um, specifically on the policy side, which deviates a little bit from the question, um, we do have a couple of examples, um, but not very strong ones on where, where we've seen gender really integrated well across the sanitation policy. And so we're really excited and would love to learn from those of you on the phone if you have good examples and would like to share those with us. Um, where you feel like uh, a government or, or other kind of decision maker actors have really taken on gender uh, with the sanitation lens uh, in, in, in their national context. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there and then pass it over to Lucero if there are any other comments. Thank you, um, and Jess, and, and I definitely agree. So why this was really not a focus of, of the evidence review, we did ask them to uh, take a look at who was really working in the area and, and, and had some, some examples to share. So definitely some of the organizations you mentioned are highlighted in the evidence reviews, as well as others. So, for example, from the donor community, um, we have some information on the work that the Swedish International Development Agency is doing, um, as well as the World Bank. Um, and, and whereas in the international NGO area, uh, also highlighting water aid and, and organizations like Plan International, who's developed a, a monitoring tool for, for gender and WASH. Um, but I don't think we could say that um, this part of the evidence review is at all exhaustive, and um, I love how, how Jess is encouraging you all to, to really tell us more about what some of the examples that could be further highlighted are. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Jess. Um, Sarah had a question um, uh, a bit earlier. Uh, she wrote, my question is around gender and sanitation around domestic livestock sanitation. Seems like there is a gap in knowledge of gender roles around that. And Lucero, you brought up livestock briefly earlier, and so um, I wanted to, to circle back on that. Um, and, then, um, um, and then we can take it from there. Um, I did, so I feel like I set myself up for this one. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't. I don't think that this area in particular was highlighted at all um, in the in the evidence review. So it would be good. Um, we can look take a look at um, some of the reference materials from that area, um, but they're not highlighted, honestly. Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay. Great. Thank you, Osero. Um and then, uh, Dato, you asked, you asked shortly after that, um, 
Would encouraging households to build their own uh, latrine toilets be one way of getting rid, rid of the challenges of the public toilet? How can we encourage that? Um, I think, uh, um, I mean, one of the things, just sticking to the evidence review as we looked all across the um, uh, sanitation value chain to see how gender affects it at each point. And so there are um, uh, some, um, some, fa some, when you think about household toilets and, and the household decision making, there's some things that you have to factor in from a gender perspective, as well as public toilets. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily uh, doing one thing negates the need for the other and vice versa. Um, and then uh, and my colleague Elise is in the room and, and looks like she, she has it. I think it's, uh, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm that the expansion of, of people's access to individual household toilets will um, reduce the need for community toilets. I think that the two things to remember is that um, that might be true for community toilets. If you get full coverage in a community, uh, women are moving throughout uh, a city at any given time. So even when they have individual household toilets, there's often still a need for them to have access to public toilets when they're out and about, whether it's at, at work, uh, it, um, suddenly at organizations like and institutions like hospitals, public offices, and other places. So I think it's important to remember that people aren't only at home, and so the individual household toilet solves some problems, but not all of the need for, for public and, and community toilets. And we have seen that even in, in communities with, with extremely high coverage of individual household toilets, there's still demand for community toilets. Um, and I think we don't have a good handle on whether that's uh, the extent to which that's behavior uh, change, the extent to which that's um, kind of just more household demand relative to the individual household toilet capacity to serve them different hours. Uh, and I'm sure that varies uh, location to location. and, and for sure, country by country, but I think we um, can't for sure say that, that individual household coverage uh, negates the need for either community toilets or um, definitely not public toilets. Okay. Thank you, Lise. Um, so Lucy's, Lucy Stevens' question was next, but I think uh, Ravi addressed that earlier. Um, uh, Rick looks like had a, um, a, a statement, uh, so we'll move on to um, uh, Harini, which I think Radu can answer, and, and her, the question is, since access, since access itself is still a problem in many countries, it is, too early to ex is it too early to expect gender participation across the value chain, especially in conveyance and treatment? I think it's not too early. Uh, I think the, the way we would look at that is we don't want to necessarily do things in a, in a particular sequence. So say let, let's focus on solving access and then to focus on, on uh, gender participation. I think it's, it's important to look at gender participation as part of the main problem, not as a problem that will be solved later. Right? And I think there are, you, know, you can be put on different progression paths if you integrate gender from the start versus addressing it later. And we'd rather be on, on that first path where gender actually drive the way we solve uh, all, all the problems, including access. So I guess the answer is not, definitely not too, not too early. Oh, coming from Brian. Uh, this is Brian. Uh, to, to add a little bit to that, as you know, kind of a lot, m most of our investments are actually focused n not only on access but on, on the full sanitation value chain. So we're making investments every day uh, in the full chain. And, and, and what, you're, what we're trying to share through this, um, through this webinar is that we're trying to uh, integrate gender into everything we do and to help our partners in, uh, integrate gender uh, and mainstream into everything that they do as well. And so, so that would be definitely, uh, we, we've got work we can do right now. Okay, thank you everyone. And, and I think uh, Janelle, Janelle had a question said, how will the gender strategy be integrated into existing investments or will it? Um, I think that's kind of what, what Brian what Brian just said. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Elaine also uh, had another question I'll go back to Radu for, but uh, the question is, should the MGF WASH grantees start including gender-related metrics in future field and pilot studies? Uh, I think I can reflect the uh, enthusiasm in the room that, that certainly the answer is, is, is yes. Um, and we, as, as a team, we've, you know, internally set some goals around uh, what we would expect grantees to do with relation to, to making 
investment more gender intentional transformative and certainly collecting data which should be a, a, a you know a, a, in the minimal set that we would expect grantees to do um, with that said we haven't yet shared any formal guidance for our grantees to do that but uh, you know you know, your enthusiasm for this is greatly appreciated. Hi, and I would just jump in, this is Jessica. I would just add in uh, to that that we are we are also going to be walking this, this journey with all of you, and so with our, our new grantees, our existing grantees, and our partners, uh, we, we hope that we can be a resource and really work with you to develop the, the best way to take this work forward and truly get to uh, gender intentional and gender transformative investments. So you are not alone. Uh, we are in this together, and, and we are also learning. And part of the purpose of this webinar was to share uh, what we know and what we don't know, uh, and, and how we're learning uh, and, and working through this together. So, uh, yes, we're excited. We hope you will be starting to think through the, the metrics as well uh, as how to apply some of these lessons to your own work. Uh, but you are not alone. So, uh, so, 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 just wanted to put that out there as well. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, the next question from uh, Latte. Uh, the question is, in your presentation, you mentioned some outcomes of studies. Could you integrate these studies as well in the summary? Uh, so what we'll share uh, is the kind of the, high, the summary of the findings of the evidence review, uh, but all of the reference studies are cited. And so if you want to drill down, drill down any further on the studies themselves and the outcomes that, that we mentioned, uh, the information is there for you. So, so hopefully that... Uh, that works and, and answers your question. Um, uh, next, we have a question from Sonia. Uh, given the impact of lack of sanitation on girls' education, should female toilet facilities in schools be a prime target to implement gender-sensitive solutions? Um, it's, uh, it's a good question, Sonia. And I, and I think as, we, as we've talked about a little bit here is, is um, uh, thinking about uh, gender across the whole uh, sanitation value chain, and, and that would certainly include um, female toilet facilities in schools, but but it's uh, um, um, an interesting. Area. I don't know, Lucero, if uh, if you have any um, any comment on this this specifically, um, please chime in. Sure, um, I think definitely uh, female toilet facilities are part of the solution. But what the evidence review is really pointing at is how those toilets are designed. So just making them single sex consistently is, is not enough, but rather that both the specific needs need to be taken into consideration, but also how those single sex toilets uh, sit within the larger context of, of the schools um, in terms of proximity to other toilets, in terms of privacy, in terms of them being properly equipped uh, to take into consideration girls' needs, those are the sorts of things that, that girls consistently raise when asked about why they wouldn't go to school, um, for example, during menstruation. Um, so it's a good start, but certainly gender analysis of a specific school um, context would give you more information on how uh, to set that up and what to take into consideration. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, so the next question was from uh, from Kitch, and it was, uh, would you like to see JMP data disaggregated by gender? What, in your opinion, would be the advantages of that? And so I'll go over to Radu, take that one. Well, thank you, uh, Kitch, for, for the question. Also uh, noting that uh, Rick from the part of the, the JMP is on the, on the call, so uh, I'm, I'm sure he, he has opinions about this. But to, to quickly answer the question, we would very much like to see more gender disaggregation in, 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 the, in the JMP data. And as I mentioned in, in, the, in the talk, um, moving from household level observation to individual level observation uh, would be a, a great step forward. Obviously, that's not a, a costless measure um, you know, in terms of increasing the, the, the time it takes to complete survey, but if we do not capture uh, gender disaggregated data within the household, there is there is little room to capture it further down downstream in, in, in the value chain. So we would really like to see um, person level information in, in the in the in the future of JMP. 
This is Brian. Uh, since, I, since we don't know how to turn Rick, uh, Rick's uh, uh, mic on, I, I think I can project uh, for him. He and Bruce have, have been very uh, visible and vocal advocates for getting uh, uh, gender segregated data wherever they can. In fact, I recently saw a great presentation of, of the work they've already done in, in driving that at the GMP level. So, absolutely. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, next question from Remy. Uh, should male and female toilet be separate or can single cabin be operated? Um, so I think, we've, I think we've talked about that a little bit during, during, during the webinar and, and how uh, the evidence um, showed that um, uh, women feel safer using separate, separate facilities if, if it's public. But uh, um, what I'll do is go over to Lucero if, if that's okay to talk a little bit more about the evidence. Cheryl? Sorry, Graham. I'm trying to find the that question. Okay. Yeah, it was. Oh, yes. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I found it. Um, I think in the evidence we saw several studies that actually took a look at um, proximity between cell and, and, and male and female um, stalls or cabins, um, and found that. Whereas solutions can be had, is like for example, how you place doors, or how you um, think about how men and, and women or, or boys and girls will access the stall separately, even when they, when they are within the same block. Um, again, it really depends on how these are set up, and 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 really taking a look at how to guarantee privacy and, and security around the stalls in order to increase use. Awesome. Thank you, Lucero. Um, so, uh, next question was from uh, from Stephen, and it wasn't it wasn't a question, more well, a statement and a question. Uh, in bringing the GSAP micro flush toilet to rural communities around the world, uh, the Global Sustainable Aid Project has several examples of uh, women intensive successful projects um, around the world. Can you provide the appropriate contact at BMJ for sharing these? Uh, yes. Um, at at this point, I guess. Um, as it relates to the webinar, you could you could probably just email them to me directly. Uh, that's Graham Sneed, um, um, and then and then we can take it from there. But also our our friends on the uh, um, gender equality team, I'm sure, would be interested. And so uh, so I'll follow up with an email after the webinar, um, and uh, and we'll work on coordinating um, getting those examples. So thank you for that. Um, uh, okay. So the next question. Um, uh, was uh, from Alexandra, and the, and the question was, do you have criteria yet for being able to identify what gender intentional and gender transformational is, e.g., like a checklist? And so we'll start with Jen uh, on this one and then take it from there. Great. Thanks for the question. Yes, we do have criteria, and Jess referenced them earlier when she showed the slide of um, how we're defining gender unintentional, intentional, and transformative. And so that's the starting point. Um, underlying each of those definitions, though, we do actually have a guide that we've developed as really a job aid for program officers to help them um, talk through with partners and have a conversation about whether, um, whether an investment meets each of those criteria so that you can help determine where the, where the investment sits on um, that spectrum. And Graham mentioned that earlier as the guide that is still under construction, but something that we will be able to share with you at some time, hopefully in the near future. But the idea behind that is really that our, our program officers here on the WASH team and across other teams would be able to then have conversations with partners um, to figure out, you know, where gender matters in that investment, how to, how to make it more salient in the design of the investment to make sure that you're actually taking it into consideration in a way that, that works and hopefully um, moves the, the needle a bit on whether that investment is gender intentional or transformative. So those will, those will be criteria that are available to you in the future. It is not, however, a checklist because we felt that people needed a bit more conversation there than actually just a, um, some boxes to tick off. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, okay, uh, moving on, the next question is from um, Rupa. Uh, the question is, in a gender budget of a country, what would the percentage allocation for sanitation and capacity building um, be? And, uh, and I guess uh, um, as far as the evidence review 
goes um, that I don't think was was part of the scope. And Lucero, correct me if I'm wrong. And so, um, so I think the answer is it, it would it would vary uh, country to country. Um, but uh, but I'll look to any of my other colleagues in the room to see to see if they have any other um, comments. But uh, um, but I guess uh, I don't think so at this time, unless Lucero does. And so, um, sorry that that's something that we can um, we can work on to see if there's a, a standard. But uh, but I, I think it would. Um, uh, be something that uh, is tough to um, um, compare between between uh, local contexts. Um, okay. Yes, Graham, uh, so I, I agree that that was not really included. All right, thanks, Lucero. Um, okay, so so we had some uh, some follow up comments from Rick in the uh, in the chat. So if uh, um, those questions around the JMP. Uh, data were shared by anyone. I encourage you to look at them. Um, and uh, don't see any more uh, questions at this point. Um, we do have a couple more minutes, so if you, if you uh, have anything um, anything unsaid, I encourage you to, uh, to ask now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, no one's typing. I think I feel like I've, I've waited the requisite amount of time. So, uh, so what we'll do is is call the call the webinar to a close. Once again, I will be sharing uh, a recording. Um, uh, yes, Kish, there we go. Uh, I, I will be sharing a recording of the webinar um, as soon as I've got it, along with the other uh, kind of tools and resources that uh, um, that I mentioned. Um, and so, thank you everyone for joining today. I'll go over to Brian to, to close us out. Uh, yeah, just uh, again, thanks for uh, for spending your time with us today. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that um, that we're using these webinars to try to um, uh, talk through issues that we think will be uh, rel uh, relevant and uh, and of value to uh, to a good number of, of you of all of our partners. And so please, uh, if you have thoughts for um, things, uh, topics you'd like us to cover in future webinars, please reach out to your uh, program officer and just let us know. And we're always uh, happy to hear any feedback you have on, on webinars or other communications from the past. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, you'll see the follow-up. Uh, thank you, Graham, and for, uh, and for Jen and Lucero and, uh, and Radu and Justin and Elise. And I uh, hope you all have a good evening, a good day.